Okay. Good morning, divers. How are you this morning? Welcome to an yet another good, at least I, I hope it will be good, <laughs> uh, dance seminar. So just for me to know who was here yesterday in my other presentation. Okay. Why are you guys doing this to, you, to yourselves? <laughs> so thanks for coming. Uh, just who was here in the previous presentation this morning or in my presentation yesterday, the first two slides are going to be exactly the same. Just hang in there. I have to situate folks seeing this for the first time or folks at home watching the, the broadcast or the recording. Um, but I promise you, at least I'll try to keep you awake this morning. Uh, I'm throwing this accent just for that. And uh, I, another thing that I'll try is to get you better, uh, a better understanding on what we do in the medical department at the end of this presentation. It will be an interaction. I need you guys. We'll have 15 to 20 minutes of information and then we'll go to the interaction part. And I really need your cooperation for that. Oh, it's not, not on the clicker. So, just to have you an idea, just to give you an idea, uh, we have the, the medical department at Dan, which I'm, I'm proud to be the, the assistant director at this moment. And we were established around the, turn it on. We were established around the emergency line in 1981. And we had from there on, this 40 plus years, we had 9,600 on average, 9,600 emergency uh, information calls and emails a year, and 2,700 emergency calls a year, which puts us in the, in the prediction for this time next year, we'll be reaching a staggering number of a half million calls and emails for the medical department. Not on the clicker. So, global. So global in terms of then USA, then America. So uh, we used to say that we are kind of a thermometer of what's happening with diving out there because People tend to call us before a dive trip or before preparing for diving to get information, medical information, discuss their, their fitness to dive and all these things. And unfortunately, we have the calls to when people are diving and there's an accident. So statistically, it tends to reflect what's happening in the market. And as we know, 2020 was a terrible year for our industry. We had people uh, not diving that much, not being able to dive. But if, if we compare to 2018 and 2019, this year we had a, a higher summer and the activity was kept for longer. So maybe we're seeing a good future in the, in the next months or probably after winter, right? How many times I'll try to click here? Uh, so just to give you a breakdown of the, the emergency or the information contacts. So I, I say contacts and not calls. If I say calls, in the, understand contacts because it's calls and emails too, okay? So just to give you a, a quick breakdown, 50% of the, of the contacts are for body systems and conditions. So mo mostly fitness to dive, so I have this or that condition, I take this or that medication, can I go diving? And just a quick pause here for the medication. Medication is usually not the issue. The issue is the underlying condition that requires the medication. So this is what we're gonna address with the person calling or emailing us. We'll say, you know what, this medication because most of the medications, we don't have any studies on them for diving, uh, but we know that this or that condition that requires this medication would or would not be fitable for, uh, uh, 
the person will not be able to dive with the condition. So, MD referrals are a quarter of what we get, and we are very proud to say here that we hold probably the largest and most updated MD referrals for dive medicine and chambers too. We don't provide chamber information uh, for the divers. We use this information for the emergency calls, and this is something that I'm, I'm gonna explain to you later, uh, but it's very important to have. And unfortunately, emergency preparedness, it's only 9% of the, the contacts we get. We are trying to get these numbers up because this will reflect in a big, big change in what we do and reduce potentially the number of accidents and the severity of the consequences of these accidents. Uh, there was a, a very nice presentation yesterday from Francois Berman, and it will be repeated tomorrow, tomorrow at 11, if I'm not mistaken. Come here, you're gonna see a terrific presentation on emergency action planning. This is very important. <laughs> <laughs> By the last one, I'll probably not click. So just to give you an idea, this is a heat map that we did from the last 500 contacts we got. 500 contacts is what happened from the beginning of the month until now, or until two days ago when I prepared this. So we can see where the information calls and emails are coming from, and we can gauge what's happening and what kind of, of questions are being asked. So, just to give you an idea, and I will revisit this exact same slide later, what we do when we get a call or an email. So there's two ways for the service, and I put here, not, not very uh, humble, but I put here, and it's a very good service that we do, and I hope in the interaction uh, part of the uh, interactive part of the presentation, that I will make justice to all the medics back home working the information line as we speak right now. Uh, but we do take calls, 8.30 to 5 Eastern time every day, Monday to Friday. Emails 24 seven through our website form. And we take dive and travel health and safety information. The, the medics that I mentioned, EMTs, paramedics, and nurses, manning this, this channel. Uh, and everyone, of course, dive medicine trained, and we're proud to say every one of us are divers, and most of us professional divers. We have a 100% response rate, so we never leave anyone without an answer, without information. And we service every diver, this is very important. Not just for the members. The members are contributing and keeping our lights on, but this is a service that we provide to the whole market, to all divers around the world. Uh, as I said, referral physician network and chamber referral network, we probably hold the best, largest, and most updated list that you can find. Just to give you an idea, this is what uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, 1,200 chambers look like around the world. You saw in the previous presentation all the codes and colors and our classification system. And to narrow down to what we have here, this is what we know it's working today and with a level of service that we can have availability and as discussed before, it depends on availability of the chamber, the chamber accepting the cases, having enough staff to run treatment tables, having guests to run treatment tables. So there's several different uh, criteria that we have to address. And for instance, 
backup. So if it's in a hospital with an ICU, we see it's a very uh, uh, risky case that probably will need surgery or ICU or anything. So we have to know that this person is in a hospital that can deal with this. And again, as, as I said, uh, we normally don't provide information for the, for the divers when they call us and they say, I'm going to this or that place. I want to know the closest uh, chamber there. I'm putting my emergency action plan in place. So first thing we do, we congratulate this diver for doing this. And this is probably the most important step on, on his or her safety. But we have a, a long uh, speech on this for the diver. But what the diver needs is not the chamber, but the closest medical facility. So most of the times, when you have an emergency, you don't need immediate recompression, but you need immediate medical evaluation. So another thing that happens a lot in diving is heart issues. And heart issues kills much more than the compression sickness. So you have to address first all the clinical things, rule out all the other issues that can kill this person, and then if recompression is needed, from that point, that medical facility, we can transfer this diver to a higher level of care and potentially to a hyperbaric chamber for recompression treatment. So, as I was saying, emergency action plan and remote areas, two things that we always have to consider. We tend to, to tailor the dives for our, for our tourists, for our clients, or even for ourselves, we tend to think the type of diving we're doing, the location of the dive, the dive site, and, and its demands. So it's a demanding current, or it's a demanding surf, or anything. And we tend to think about that, but we usually do not think about how remote it is and how to get out of there. So we have a saying in the department, and one of my colleagues, Lana, used to say this a lot, uh, is if you take a plane, a boat, and a donkey to get to the dive site, you're probably going to need a donkey, a boat, and a plane to come back. So think about that and plan it well. I'm going through these slides, but as, as I said, it's being streamed and it's being recorded, so you can see this in our uh, YouTube channel. And marketing was very generous to make us some QR codes. So this one can take you directly to our form to get in contact with us. So if you don't want to call or if you are after hours, you can just get this QR code and it will take you directly to the form. You don't have to go through all the pages on the website. I'll, I'll leave it for a second so, so people can, can take a picture or, as I said, go back to the, to the YouTube channel, pause at this point and, and get the QR code if you want. Just waiting. Okay, I still see people with phones up. Are we good? Good? So, these are the steps for the interaction, for, for, sorry, for the information interaction, and gathering information and dispensing recommendations. As was mentioned in the previous lecture and yesterday, we don't do uh, um, any medical diagnose or any prescription or anything over the phone, right? We are limited from what we're hearing. We're over the phone. And Matthias, that you just saw lecturing here, he used to say that until I ask the person for their age, it's, it's normally something that we cannot gauge. So I, I may be talking to an 81-year-old person or to an 18-year-old person. I don't know. So we're very limited. We don't have a patient, uh, doctor-patient relationship. 
and we cannot even legally do any kind of diagnose or prescribe any treatment over the phone. So what we do is recommendations. The best recommendation possible based on all the information given, all the conditions, all the medical information that this person can have for us, and based on our 40 plus years of experience and similar cases that we saw before, our collective knowledge about this. So, one of the best things that we do every day is consultation with doctors. So it's different when we're talking to a diver. We're talking in layman terms. We're trying to explain things, and we love to do that. But the best thing we do every day is when we talk to the doctor. So we try always to get this person to put their doctors in contact with us, their, this divers to put their doctors in contact with us, so we can discuss peer-to-peer -peer what's happening and what can be the best course of action for, for this person. Doctors, on the other hand, they love this. They love this because they don't know. Usually they don't know much about scuba diving and diving medicine, diving physiology. And when we give this, uh, I say, just a cherry on top, they know a lot about the disease, they know a lot about the patient, and we just, <coughs> sorry, we just give them the cherry on top, the small amount of knowledge that they lack about diving physiology, they can understand everything and they can give a good recommendation for this divers. I'm passing this because I'm going to get back to this. We're going to follow this on the, on the interactive part, which starts now. So I know the pooling systems not always work for this. So wait a minute. I'll try with my phone first. Let's see if it works. And no, it won't. My phone is not prepared for this. So let's real. Let, let's do as the the younger people say. Let's do it for reals. So let's really interact, and that's why I said I would need you guys. I really need someone that can come here and put a phony information call for us. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Please buy the red phone. <laughs> You can even take your mask if you want. And I'll, I'll use my headset so I can <laughs> really take your call. And as I said, I'll try to make justice test, to the magic. I think it's working. If you want to stay here in this, test, this test, area test, by the phone, test, you test. can take your mask and. <laughs> Wait, hold on. It's on, it's on. Test. Okay. It's good? I can also talk loud. And you can take your mask if you <coughs> want. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, okay. So, good morning. This is Camilo on the information line. How can I help you? Good morning. My name is Hannah. I have a diver complaining of pain after a dive this morning. Okay, Hannah. You came to the wrong lecture. <laughs> this is the information line. You, you have to call another number. I'll oh, give you the number wait, for the I'm sorry. emergency line. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also have no. a question. Uh huh. I've been having a lot of ear trouble recently. Okay. <laughs> Hannah, let me go back just a little bit and let me start asking you for your personal information. Okay. So are you a DEN member by any chance? I am. Oh, great. So I just got your, your information here in the system with your DEN ID number. And I have your callback number, which is this, 555. Huh? Are it, is that right? Yeah, it is. So if we got disconnected, I can call you back, okay? Don't worry Sounds about great. that. Sounds great. So let me, let me help you with your problem. I have in the system, I already have your age and all your past history here. And I see you are a healthy young woman trying to dive and having issues with your ear. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Perfect. So how can I help you? I've been having trouble equalizing. Okay. What type of 
equalization did you try? Uh, pinching the nose. Okay, the Valsalva maneuver, right? You pinch your nose and you blow. Correct. Okay. And what happens? It's both sides, what, what is happening when you do that? Uh, it doesn't work on my right side. Just the right side? Just the right. Okay. Any issues with this year in the past? Any infection, anything that you really need to treat in this year? Yes, actually. I've had a couple infections. Okay. And how did you treat these infections? Antibiotics. When was the last one? Two years ago. Okay. And any complications for that? Any hearing loss? Anything? Not that I know of. Okay. Okay. So, and what is your credential in diving? How, how long are, are you diving and what is the highest level of training you have? Um, I'm a scuba instructor. Okay. Since 2009. Oh, perfect. So you're a professional with several divers, dives <laughs> yeah. under, under your belt. Just a few, yeah. And you're just having this issue lately? Correct. You never had this before? Uh, well, since the infections, yes. Okay. So at this point, I think you may be experiencing some sequelae from your infections in your ear, and this is something that can happen. You can have a hardening of the tympanic membrane, you can have several different things. And at this point, my recommendation to you would be for you not to dive for a while and to seek a, a specialty evaluation with an ENT, a ear, nose, and throat doctor. You can search for it online, you can go to your doctor if you already have one, or we can search for one for you on our database. Either way, you can put your doctor in contact with us and we'll be more than glad to discuss and try to see how we can help. But keep in mind that ENTs, they really know a lot about diving because it's, it's, very, it, it's a very close field of, of knowledge. They know about diving, they know about flying, they know about pressure changes in your middle ear and they can discuss this. But you really need uh, a specialty, uh, a specialized evaluation, okay? Thank you. No, no problem. <laughs> Any doubts or anything that I can help you with more than this? That's it. Yeah, just that? Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
when was your problem and what was done for you? What kind of treatment you did? So you had this, uh, I'll fill in for you, okay? Right. So you had this, this issue when you were diving. It was diagnosed as a shoulder DCS, so pain only DCS. You were treated with a recompression table. Yes. You got better. Yes. The doctor there uh, discharged you, saying that you have to, to stay at least three to four months without diving. And now you passed this time and you're calling us back to, to discuss yes. your returning to diving. Yes. So, what I would recommend to you at this point is the dive physician that treated you initially, if you can schedule with him or her to go back there and discuss your returning to diving now that you are after this period that they recommended. Um, they can call us, we can discuss the case if there's any particulars on it. But if not, it's just a regular fitness to dive exam and you are good to go. You were treated, you were back, and you had no sequelae from this. It was a very mild case, yes. as you described to me. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you can, you can return to your regular diving activities, but you really need this evaluation, uh, mainly because I see here, I got your information, and I see here you were a member with us. Yes. You were over 55, and I can, I can see here that you have some history that you need to discuss with your physician. I just yes, I do. put some things, yes, okay? Yes, you're right. <laughs> so this is something that you can do. We can refer to you. We have an extensive referral physician database that we can search for someone for you. Fantastic. In the islands, and you can, mm -hmm. you can go there and, and see this physician. And either your physician, the physician that treated you, your, your primary care physician, the physician that treated you, on the incident or this referral physician, all of them can always count with us to discuss the case and have some help on understanding the physiology and all the things for your return to diving. Does the physician take Medicare? <laughs> this is, you, you have to see this with your oh. physician. Okay. We cannot say that, but for sure, your physician will know that they can count with us. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. I, I took over your call. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> no, thank you. But thanks for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So, put down the phone, and it's ringing again. And it, it will be ringing for the next half an hour. Next time I'll make this ring. I'll, I'll put some clicker on it that I'll bring. Thanks for helping me. <laughs> Good morning, sir. I've got Good a question morning. for you. My name's Brett. I'm a Dan member. Uh, Thank you for your membership. It's, oh. it's what keeps us going. Every little bit helps. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Camilo uh, in the medical department. How can I help you this morning? Well, I've been out because of COVID, and I had a pulmonary fit test uh, back to normal. My chest x-rays are all normal and the doctor's not sure if I should be returning back to diving and doing what I should be doing. Uh, I did the six minute walk test and my uh, partial pressure, my pulse oximeter was saying that I'm in the 98% um, aspects. Everything points to back to normal life. Can I start diving? I was hoping for this call. <laughs> I'm your ringer for the day. <laughs> no, I'm joking because this is something that we're getting a lot right now. We even created, who was here for the previous presentation in our system, MSCC, uh, we created a new flag just for COVID and returning to diving after COVID. We have an awesome study for returning to diving after COVID. So. Uh, we had, I think we closed the, the, the enrollment in 1,200 people, right? 1,300 people. So we were really focused on this, and I was really hoping for your call. So what I can say to you is it's still very new to us. We don't know the long-term effects of the disease. 
But what we know is uh, you have to be perfectly aware and, and, and know for sure that your lung function and your lung structure are intact. So who's going to do this? Your physician talking to us and discussing what kind of tests and what we, we can do right. to help your physician. And again, I'm not a pneumologist. I'm a, oh, from, from my background, I'm a, a radiation oncologist, okay. and I, I worked for the last 20 years with dive medicine. Well, shoot, I should have come up and said, okay, I have osteomyelitis. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that one out there. So, uh, and, and, and this is the beauty of things, right? Right. We have more than 40 medical specialties. If we count the subspecialties, it's 100 and something. So no one knows everything about every aspect of medicine. But what we do is get in contact with your physician and discuss the things that are pertinent to, to diving. So your pulmonologist knows a lot more than I do or anyone, any, Sadly, any of us do. Sadly, the pulmonologist doesn't know anything about diving. But they know about, yeah, that, yeah they, that's they what I was getting. They know about my internal, but they don't know about the pressures. They or, know about the lungs. And that's, that's why they refer and me we'll to you. And give you, we'll give them the, the, the cherry on top which is right. the knowledge okay. about what happens with the lungs when we're diving, changes in pressure, changes, uh, changes in um, the amount of air we have in our lungs and all of this. So what I was saying to you, just to try to explain in terms of lung function and lung structure, we, can, we, we need to be sure that your lungs are not in any way compromised that they would and the, probably the most important thing that we need to avoid or the most riskier thing we need to avoid is air trapment. So when you're diving, if your lungs for any reason because of the disease has some kind of scarring and I'm, I'm using a very large broad term here, if your lungs have some scarring then you, you have a tendency to put air in this, in this part of the lung, and this air will not exit in a proper manner when you are surfacing. You're gonna dive, you're gonna go down perfectly normal, but when you're coming up, you can have this trapment, entrapment of air, and you can burst some alveoli on your lungs. This can be minor, and sometimes people say, oh yeah, I, was, I did this before and I had no problems and out of the sudden I did another dive and I had a big issue. Because probably it was happening that previous dives too, but it was small enough. And for lungs, for instance, there's, there's an uh, uh, interesting thing is what we call a parallel organ. So every minute functional uh, uh, unit of the lung is working in parallel with other uh, uh, units. So you have thousands or maybe millions of these small units working in parallel. If you take out a few, it will not make a big difference, right? It's like the, the lights on the, on the Christmas tree. One or two off, yeah, they're okay. If we're talking about an organ that is in series, so spine, for instance. If we get just a small unit compromised, everything that comes after is compromised too. So for lungs, there's this just com complacency because of yeah. this. But we have to be very aware that it's not in this situation and you have this function and that's the first part where it's structure, right? And then the function is okay too. So you're saying that you have, uh, uh, you are, your saturation is decreasing when you're doing exercise, right? You right, I, I, my oxygen to, intake is back to normal. I, instead of being at a low when I had COVID at 64%, okay. that I'm back to 98% and I'm able to do a six minute walk test without any uh, adversity. Okay. Um, I'm, there's not any more, noticeable compromise in my lung and 
the x-rays show clear. Um, I have not had an MRI or any other advance. Um, so I don't know. Imaging. Yeah, yeah, imaging aspects that would give me more detail. Yeah. And, and this is not always needed. A x-ray can, a good x-ray can see enough. And if we it's, it's compatible with the clinic that we're seeing in you, it's maybe something that we can, that we can approve. But not us, but your doctor. Uh, but one thing that you're saying is about the exercise. The, the six minute walk is not so compatible with, with what we do when we're diving. Because we have to think one important thing here. When we're diving and everything goes exactly as planned, right. it's a level of exercise. We know that because of our air consumption, right? We, we notice that. So when a small thing goes out of the, the plan, so you got a current, it's colder than you, you thought it would be, uh, or you have to assist your, your dive buddy in something, uh, you, need, you, you, you notice that your consumption goes up, right? Because you're doing more exercise. And in a situation like this, you can be in danger. So you, if you are out of the normal or if you need, and this is one of the cardinal rules, right? We have to be fit enough to rescue others and self-rescue in an emergency situation, deal with an emergency situation. So for this, you have to have a better fitness and, and not just the, the six minute walk. Would it be advisable to do the pulmonary cardio uh, fit test, that cardio fit test that they're recommending? Maybe, maybe. It's one of the tests that we're going to discuss with your physician and get a better decision for you. What I can say for you right now is, if possible, refrain from diving uh, as, as long as you can. Schedule as soon as you can with your physician. And as you said, your physician probably manifested to you already that he or she doesn't know much about scuba diving, right? Right. So, you're gonna help them, and, and trust me, he or she is gonna love you for that. Put us in contact, we will discuss, and we will see what, what is needed in your case. Okay. And again, it's case by case, right? Oh, right? There's no one size fits all solution. We're gonna discuss mainly with something new that we don't know much yet. We have to discuss case by case. Will my Dan insurance cover all this? Mm, probably <laughs> not. No, probably not. This, your, your primary uh, health care insurance will probably take care of this. Uh, but here in the medical department, we're not no. trained or licensed to discuss insurance. <laughs> so I cannot, I cannot say much. I can transfer you to our claims department or our, mem our membership department, and they can take this. They are trained for this. They are... Uh, 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 licensed insurance agents. Okay. We are not. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anything else that I can help you with oh, this morning? No, I'm just trying to be able to start diving and get back to DEMA and doing the, you know, spending money. Well, this is good. <laughs> good for the industry, right? For all of us. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more call. Anyone? Oh, sure, sure. Either. No, for sure there's, there's situations where we, we don't have uh, a, a good interaction. It's, it's always like that, right? Okay. Human interactions, Unf unfortunately, they're not always good. 
but I can say to you the, the vast majority are very good, very good. Because keep in mind, and, and I, I can say this to you as a physician, having someone that really knows what they're talking about, that, that really knows the area of dive medicine, and myself, I don't know anything about that. Having this person, this colleague, doing this peer-to-peer -peer consultation for free, and, and backing me up on this, I love this. As, as a physician, I'm, I'm in heaven because I have not one, but I have a group of people back there. Because some cases are, are hard. We will not, I'm, I'm doing something very relaxed here. But the, the previous presentation, Matthias showed, we do uh, QA of our calls. We do a lot of things on the backstage. And some cases, more complex cases, we discuss among all of us. So the whole team. Sometimes we have three doctors, one nurse, and five paramedics discussing a case in a, in a meeting room there in the department to get a best possible response to this person. So it's, it's, it's very complex on, on the other side and almost always with a, with a very good uh, um, response from the, from the physician on the other, on the other side. They, they, they perceive this. Sometimes they get in contact with us and we say, you know what, I'm going to take this to my CMO, I'm going to discuss this with the director of the department, and the three of us, or even more people, we're going to discuss and, and get back to you. We're going to talk to research in the building. We just go one stair, one, one floor up, and we get there to the director of research, and we discuss the case. We can, across the floor, we go to the director of risk mitigation and discuss the case. So we have the resources. And, and they, they perceive this and they love that. Of course, there's the outliers, always, but yeah. No, no problem, no problem. So the phone rings and Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Camilo on the information line. How can I help you? I'm Nicholas. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be diving um, two weeks, I'm proud two weeks. And I usually go for a run every day. I like to run. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything I read tells me I, I should be running and diving at the same time during those weeks. Uh, can you help me with that? Sure. So exercise and diving is a, a pre significant uh, discussion. There's lectures on this. And after we finish this call, I see here that you are a member. I have all your contact information. I have your email already. I just confirmed with you your email. And after we end this call, I'll send you a link for a very good presentation uh, that we have in-house about exercising and great, diving. Great, great. But what I can say to you is, you have to be very careful to match the two of them. So exercising in a good manner and the level of exercise that you're used for, that you used to, to do, uh, can not be detrimental or even, I won't say helpful, but it can keep you healthy. So you, you, it will be good for your diving. The problem we have is when people try to match, and this happens a lot because I'm traveling to a place that I've never been before and I, I don't intend to come back in the next 10 years, so I want to do everything that I have there. We just have a, a gentleman from Hawaii. So I want to go there, I want to scuba dive, I want to surf, I want to hike, I want to do my, my track, my bike tracks, uh, all at once, and I'm not, fit for all of this. I'm not used to do all these things together. And this is where we can have a problem. If in your case, you're saying, I used to run and I'm going for a dive trip. I don't want to be the whole dive trip without exercising. I'm going to lose my, 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 my preparation. I'm preparing for a half marathon in a couple of months and I don't want to lose my preparation. So what I would recommend to you is, just keep 
as far apart as you can from your diving. So if you're diving multiple days, I cannot say to you, no, just do your exercise 20 hours before you're diving. Yeah, it's two hours after the last one, right? So try to put in the middle as far apart as possible from both diving days. If you can put extra days or interval days on your, on your diving. So I dive for a day, I rest a day, I do my exercise, I dive for another day, I rest a day. If you can do that, it's best. If you can't, put as far apart and don't put extra effort. Put the, the level you're used to. So if you're doing a... Yeah, or even lighter a, runs. Yeah, if you're doing a step training, don't go up the steps that, that week. Try to keep the level or even a little less than what you're being, what, what you have been doing for the last weeks. So doing this, you can keep yourself active and you're not putting yourself at risk, mainly if you are doing uh, more than one dive a day. I would not recommend it, definitely I would not recommend it for you uh, the compression dives in this week or those crazy things of six, seven repetitive dives a day. One or two at most. Right. Yeah, I would be diving, no I would say, ones. twice a day or so. And I, my plan was to run 30 minutes a day or so. But maybe oh, I could, sorry. 30 minutes a day uh -huh. in the mornings or in the afternoons, depending on the schedule for the divings. But I understand what you say. I try to keep it as light as possible on the exercise and then focus on the diving. I mean, it's, I'm not preparing for anything. I just want to know how they combine because I understand that heavy exercise may bring the compression sickness. If you dive too much, is that, that, that's the case? And one thing that I would say to you is hydration. Keep an extra effort on your hydration. Don't overhydrate before the dive, immediately before the dive, because you put yourself at risk for immersion pulmonary edema. But Try to hydrate as much as you can after the dive and before your exercise, okay? So you, the idea is you have some uh, um, diluted gas in your, in your blood, right? In your tissues. So after the dive, it's the peak and then it follows down. It, it falls down. So if you start hydrating after you finished your dive, you can dilute this and you can wash very, very vaguely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right. using it in a broader sense. So you can wash this, this gas as much as you can before your run, your run. So you do your run, you hydrate to prepare for the next day of diving. You hydrate as best as you can. In the morning of the dive, hydrate normally. Don't overhydrate. Got it. And then you do your dive again and just repeat this every day. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Anything else that I can help no, you No, that's pretty clear. I've been looking forward to, for the study. You wanna send it by email? The study? The, 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 the presentation that you told me about. Oh the, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll send it to you, don't worry. After <laughs> thank we, you. we finish the call, I'll, I'll send this to you. And thank you so much for your support as a member. It's what keeps us going, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Camila. Thank you. Thank you. So, I don't think we have time for another one, but any questions? Yeah? And we're five minutes from the next presentation. If I can take here, I can take you guys, I, I can take your questions outside, okay? So you, sir? Oh. The emergency? The emergency action plan app. We don't have an app yet, but uh, uh, yeah.